Good morning. We're here today to discuss Alabama's preparedness for Ebola. I know the potential for an Ebola outbreak in Alabama is of great concern to many people. I want to stress at this time, though, there is no confirmation and no confirmed cases of patients with Ebola in Alabama. Uh, Ebola is not spread through the air, uh, by water, or in general by food. As with any preparedness, uh, it is essential to, uh, to be prepared, and that's what we're going to do here in Alabama. In the event that Ebola spreads to Alabama, uh, we are ready and we are prepared to respond. The Alabama Department of Public Health is taking several steps to ensure that if Ebola is confirmed in Alabama, we're able to respond quickly and effectively. Joining me today is our state health officer, Dr. Don Williamson, and Patty Miller with Baptist South Medical Center. The Department of Public Health and the Hospital Association have partnered together to ensure every health care worker in Alabama knows the proper steps to identify someone with the potential to have Ebola or those who may have that particular disease. As a physician, uh, early in my training, I spent many hours in the emergency room. I know how critical a, a proper diagnosis is. The more information that is available when a patient is in the emergency room, the better chance that we have at a proper medical diagnosis. Ebola is characterized by sudden high fever, weakness, and may be accompanied by other symptoms including headache, joint and muscle aches, vomiting, and diarrhea. may have stomach aches. They also often have, uh, obviously, a lack of appetite. Dr. Williamson and his staff are working with health care providers across the state to ensure they know the symptoms of Ebola and know how to respond and to report any suspected cases. The Alabama Hospital Association has provided a checklist to all Alabama hospitals from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The checklist provides practical and specific suggestions to ensure hospital staffs are able to detect Ebola cases protect employees, and respond appropriately to patients. I now want to introduce the, our best state medical officer in the United States, Dr. Don Williamson, and he will provide more specifics. And following Dr. Williamson, you'll hear from Patty Miller with Baptist South Medical Center here in Montgomery. Patty is the Infection Prevention Coordinator and she can speak firsthand about how Baptist South is preparing for the virus with the assistance of the Alabama Hospital Association. Dr. Williamson. Thank you, Thank you Governor. I think that the logical question is why are we so focused on a disease that, for which there's only been one case in the United States, uh, and a disease that is transmitted largely thousands of miles away? I think the outbreak or the case in, in Dallas tells us how we would be most likely to see Ebola in the United States and in Alabama. I think the, the case in Dallas also identifies for us that a disease thousands of miles away can very quickly strike home in a place like Alabama. The most likely scenario for Alabama to face a case of Ebola is an individual who has been in West Africa, in a country where the virus is transmitted, who then boards a flight feeling well and is afebrile, arrives in this country afebrile and feeling well. But sometime in that period of 21 days after exposure, usually around day 6, 8, 10, they begin to feel ill with fever and flu-like symptoms. They go to their local hospital. There is nothing specific about those symptoms. It's at that point that the preparedness that we have worked on and are working with our partners in hospitals and physicians, it's at that point that the preparedness kicks in. There is nothing we can do about that first case. What we want to try to prevent are the cases that arise from that first case and certainly prevent any what are called 
third generation cases, cases that arise from people exposed to that first case. How do you do that? In the scenario I just presented, the single most important piece of information is that history of travel to West Africa. Now that certainly doesn't mean that every person who comes in with flu-like illness who's been to West Africa has Ebola. They can have the flu. However, for purposes of protecting healthcare workers and protecting other people, it's critical that we not miss that initial exposure, that initial opportunity. That was one of the problems in Dallas. So one of the things we've done over the last day or two is we have sent out a toolkit to every Alabama hospital, which provides them, number one, information on the questions and the, that they need to be asking patients, and that travel history becomes so important. Second, it's the information about how they need to protect their staff. You know, you, you've all, we've all seen the pictures of people coming back from Africa in sealed isolation units and seeing the hospital suites in sealed in, 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 uh, uh, in, in places like Nebraska and, and in Emory and Atlanta. And while those are nice, they're not absolutely necessary to control Ebola. Ebola can be controlled with basic prevention and infection control procedures. We're talking about gowns water impermeable gowns, we're talking about gloves, we're talking about uh, masks, we're talking about eye goggles or face shields. The sort of infection contro control precautions that are in place and available in every hospital in the state. A private room with a private toilet. Those are the sorts of things that at least initially you want to have in place for that patient that I just described coming into Alabama. And then it shifts. The medical community will take over determining if or if, if or if not the patient has Ebola. Then it shifts to if that patient has Ebola, then the public health response starts. The public health response in that case is basic epidemiology 101, something that we tend to lose a lot of in, in, in high-tech medicine. But it's interviewing the patient. It's interviewing every contact the patient had. It's identifying those contacts. It's ensuring that every one of those contacts is put under close observation with at least twice daily fever watches, maybe hourly fever watches, so that if they become ill, number one, they haven't exposed anybody else, and number two, if they become ill, they can then be moved very quickly to health care without exposing additional individuals. So the control of Ebola in this country is really around basic infection control precautions. It's around very good medical histories and travel histories, and it's going to be around basic epidemiology 101. I'll be glad, we'll be glad to talk, answer questions in a minute, but let me stop there and turn it over to, uh, to Patty. As Dr. Williams, <clears throat> Dr. Williamson said, we are prepared. I do have my counterparts at Jackson's in the um, audience with me today, and the Alabama Department of Public Health, as well as the Alabama Hospital Association, Association have been excellent in helping us to prepare and make sure that we would take care of an Ebola patient. We d actually had a webinar that the Alabama Department of Public Health put on the day after the case was diagnosed in Texas. So that information was very helpful for us. And as Dr. Williamson said, we do have a checklist. Hospitals around the state are looking at that chest checklist and making sure we have everything in place. But as he said, the most important thing is for us to catch them at the front door. So that's why we have signs up. We make sure when we're triaging the patient, anybody with signs and symptoms that has come from Africa, from Western Africa, or anyone who has taken care of someone over there would automatically not staying in our emergency room, waiting room, they would be put back into a special room with a, ba um, a private bathroom. The, we actually have a cart so that we would make sure that we had all the personal protective equipment available right there. And we are training our people to make sure that they know how to appropriately wear that personal protective equipment. So I feel like we are prepared as the hospitals in the state to 
to take care of this. One other thing is that we are to notify the Alabama Department of Public Health within four hours if we have one of those, those type patients come through our emergency department and believe me, we would be on the phone. <laughs> as well as, we are also working with our partners in the community, so if we would not have direct admits into the hospital, if someone showed up at one of the physician offices with these signs and symptoms, then we would ha direct them through our emergency department to that special area where we have all of the equipment available and ready to take care of that patient actually was uh, with the EMS um, yesterday just to make sure and they said that they are also being trained as to what to do if um, a patient should be transported by ambulance, that sort of thing. Thank you. We'll have some questions in just a second. Uh, and before we take questions, uh, I also want to recognize uh, the training that's taking place for, uh, in, at our Center for Domestic Preparedness in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, this FEMA training facility is currently being used by the CDC to train healthcare workers going to West Africa to respond to the Ebola outbreak. Now that's here in Alabama. This three-day course will instruct practitioners on how to protect themselves while providing basic clinical care to Ebola-infected patients. This CDP has trained people all over our country for this disaster preparedness, and now they're preparing medical uh, workers internationally. Again, let me say, we have no reason to believe that anyone in Alabama is infected at this time or, or is at risk at this time but if it does happen, we want everyone to know that Alabama, just like we are with all natural disasters, we will be prepared. 